You know, movies take a ton of work. I'm talking about literally hundreds of people coming together to create something that is sometimes truly spectacular, and other times kind of horrible. But we're not here to talk about the quality of films this week, as right now we're here to focus on the effort that people put in to produce these flicks. And I'm not talking about the basic stuff. I mean the crazy moments. The scenes that take so much time and energy that they leave their crews just ragged. Did you know about the action sequence with Jackie Chan that took nearly 3,000 takes to nail? How about the crazy thing that Charlie Chaplin ate while he was on set? Or just the insane amount of work that went into creating the lightsaber effects for the original Star Wars? All these examples and more coming up right now. Hey everybody, welcome to the Behind the Screens podcast. I'm John Aldis and joining me this week is my good buddy, Esh. Esh, how you doing? Hey there, I'm doing fine, thank you. Thank you for having me. So, as I said in that introduction, we're going to be talking about movie scenes or shots that just took crazy amounts of effort to actually, like, get committed to film. And there are yeah. some there are some doozies, like some really just crazy stuff that people had to do. That's the world of movies, man. What a, what a lot of people don't seem to realize is that there's a lot more than, than the camera guy and the actors going on at any time in movies. Every single thing you yeah. see, every single glass of water on a table somewhere is somebody's job. And I mean, on top of that, so many people think that the filmmaking is all just like fun and games. You know, it's everyone playing pretend and like you got cameras and it just seems so glamorous and fun. But it's hard work. I was about to say exactly the glamour thing is what people tend to forget. It's like this is completely besides the, the subject we're going to talk about. But a lot of the time when I hear, oh, how could he take that job and do that crappy movie when he's known for these because he's got bills to pay, man. <laughs> like you say, it's a job. Yeah. You know, something to note is that oftentimes these things that seem like they take a ton of effort in the moment, the actors might not necessarily think so. It's really easy to get swept up in the excitement of being on set. And when that happens, you find yourself, you know, it's really easy to have the mindset of the ends justify the means. And while being on set can be fun, Trust me, I know. It's still a ton of work. Work that a lot of the times people are pretty willing to do. There have been some some just insane things that people have done. We're going to start off by talking about the sequences that took a lot of effort from the people in front of the camera. Yes. We'll get to the people behind the camera here in a little bit. But let's start things off by talking about... Uh, you know, one of the biggest movies of all time. Yes. Titanic. Yes. You've, you've of course seen Titanic, I assume. I have seen Titanic, but it's been a very long time. So, so it's, 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 I'm a little fussy on like big dramatic moments, but I do know what you're, what you're about to talk about. Yes. What you see? Iceberg, right ahead. Thank you. Yeah. It's, it's hard to forget though, the big sequence at the end. So after the the boat has has sunk and everybody's in the water. Yes. You know that 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 movie moment that launched 80 billion online debates about whether or not Rose could have just scooted over <laughs> a little bit so that Jack could have gotten under the door. That's true. You know, that that whole moment. But in that sequence there's just a ton of extras sitting in the mm. water all around them. And something to note about this is that James Cameron when it comes to this movie was a serious stickler for accuracy. Mm. He wanted everything to be as authentic as possible down to the point that when they were filming that sequence, they had all these extras in a giant tank, this, this huge, huge, like multi-million gallon tank that they had been using for filming. And the extras and all of the actors and everything were not allowed to get out of the tank. <laughs> That's completely in between insane. Takes because like, you know, the the actual people weren't allowed to get out of the water, so you can't. The actual people also died. <laughs> kind yeah, of thing well, that, you, know? you know. Luckily, the worst thing that the extras reportedly had to endure was people weren't even allowed to get out of the water to, like, go to the bathroom. Yeah. So people were, like, peeing in the water. Oh. Which, I mean, like... Who hasn't peed in a swimming pool before? Yeah, but, but this is, but you know. Who is also not told never to do that again? <laughs> yeah, you are you learn at a pretty young age that you shouldn't do that. It's kind of gross, especially when you're like hundreds of, well, maybe dozens. I don't know how many at a time they were in that tank, but probably more dozens. Lots. But 
Yeah, that's that's pretty that's pretty freaking gross. <laughs> yeah, that was um, that was a little much. I mean, that's that's the thing with crowd things in general. There's a lot of cases where where huge crowds in in movies aren't treated that well for the sake of authenticity. Um, it's on a completely different scale. It's a much much smaller movie, but Eight Mile, if you've seen that, the Eminem movie. Um, but there's on the DVD, there's a whole little documentary about what it was like inside the club, the uh, the battle rap club that a lot of the movie takes place in. Between takes, between rap battles, they'd be there for hours wearing big coats on a set that's made to look like this club just dying of heat, man. I don't like going to regular clubs. <laughs> I could only imagine clubs that are just like lit up by, you know, giant tungsten light bulbs and, yeah. you know, a ton of electrical equipment running around. Like, it had to be really hot in there. This is another thing people tend to not realize about any kind of stage work, be it theater or film. The lights, they're so freaking hot. Especially when you're wearing costumes and you, you have to look like you're outside, but you're actually inside a set. You think about like, you know, your average, your average like home lighting doesn't put off a ton of heat. But when you're talking about light bulbs that are putting off literally like hundreds upon hundreds of watts oh, of yeah. energy... It gets really hot. And yeah, nowadays we have LED panels and these sort of things, but you can't use LED panels for everything on a film set. There was a time where movie lights were extremely hot. So, so that, I mean, that's just one other example of the first example I could think of, of a large crowd of extras just in terrible conditions. And it's like, I know authenticity. I understand why you would think, hey, we need this to be as, as authentic as possible. People need to look exhausted. I get it, but also, it's a movie. And nobody in the audience is going to notice, hey, that guy seems to be a little more energetic than the others. That guy on the left, way back. Either way, it just goes to show that sometimes even the just, like, most mundane thing to general audiences took just crazy amounts of effort to mm -hmm. actually get out, or people had to suffer, you know, for something that we just take for granted on screen. Yeah, because, like, all we see is a couple seconds of people splashing around. They were there for hours. Yeah, if not days. I mean, I've, I've been an extra on a couple of, of TV things. Like, I've had, I've had to retake grabbing a door handle. Literally just that, a, a four-second shot. I once had to retake something like that 17 times. So oh, yeah. ju just imagine a whole crowd of people in a tank. And you know, that that's actually a good segue onto the next example that I want to talk about, mm. which is like, because sometimes, you know, y you hear these stories about like actors sometimes having to do like 60, 70 takes to, yeah. to nail something. It, Kubrick was well known for being a director who pushed his actors to do just insane numbers of takes. You know, I mean, you think about there is that there's that famous 127, right? Yeah, 100, 127 takes. It was Jeez. it was Shelley Duvall on The Shining. <laughs> I don't Boy. remember exactly which scene it was. Here's Johnny. <laughs> no, um, but I do remember hearing stories about people breaking down crying on that set. Oh yeah, yeah. He like tortured Shelley Duvall for that movie. It was really bad, but. Mm -hmm. 127 takes is crazy, but that does not hold a candle to the world record number of takes for the final fight sequence for the film Dragon Lord, which is a older Jackie Chan film. Yes. Like pre-Hollywood Jackie Chan, right? Yeah. Back yeah. when he was doing all Hong Kong cinema and stuff. Right. He took a record 2,900 <laughs> takes to nail that final sequence. And I'm, that's not hyperbole. I'm not exaggerating. No. That is an actual, like, Guinness Book of World Records, like, record number of takes. I think I think that actually manages to break the amount of retakes most entire movies do. Oh, yeah. I mean, that's incredible. Like, at what point do you just think to yourself, maybe we should figure something else out? For this. Maybe we should you know, film a different punch. Yeah, try something. Try something different. Maybe, maybe tone this this stunt down a little bit. Martial arts films and action films in general are kind of their own little beast. Um, when it comes oh, to yeah. fighting scenes, a lot of people do what a lot of people do when they make fight scenes is that they break the fight up in tiny, tiny pieces. I don't know if anyone who listens to this knows this, but it can be like it can be like three hits. Yeah, that's why you'll see like action set pieces that are edited 
like like for instance the born films those action yes. set pieces are cut up so like rapid fire with their jump cuts that it's kind of hard to to follow exactly what's going on. I mean, when you're when you're good at what you do, you can do that really, really well. But a lot of the time, it'll be like one, two, three. Okay, we got those hits. Now let's do that from three okay. other angles, and then we do one, two, three. These three kicks. Yeah. With Hong Kong cinema, though, especially like martial arts film in general, they do it a little differently sometimes because they like to show off their their actors' physical capabilities, especially when you're dealing with like kung fu. So they tend to linger on shots. Imagine having to do a, tw- let's just say 12 alone, a 12 yeah. piece segment of parrying, blocking, kicking. If someone is off by one millimeter, it's it's shot. Like it's ruined. And I mean, when you're dealing with somebody as talented as Jackie Chan, you're going to, you're going to try to show as much of the actual action without cutting of course possible. the man the man is a legend for a ton of reason his physical prowess uh i mean he's aged so it's not quite at the level it was at one point but still yeah. amazing um anyone who's seen drunken master can attest to this man being a beast we could sit here and we could do this entire episode just about jackie Chan, <laughs> because this is a dude who has broken like pretty much every bone in his body at some point, you know, and so like mm. he is no stranger to taking crazy amounts of takes to nail something. Uh, and he's a perfectionist. Like, like that's yeah. kind of the thing. I, I believe he grew up in like Chinese opera. Yes. That's which is this start. extremely hardcore style of growing up. Like oh, yeah. that's your parents basically sign your rights away to these people. As I said, he's not a stranger to taking crazy amount of takes. For instance, uh, another one of his movies, Young Master, he yes. had a fight scene that took 329 takes. It's completely, completely nuts. Yeah. And at I mean, what, like... At what point do you ask yourself, like, who's going to notice that this punch was one inch off? He would. Yes, he would. And that's all that matters to him. Yeah, I think that's the main thing is that I think that a lot of times it comes down to, like, nobody else would know, but we'd know. I mean, that's that's what happens with films in general. Um, we talked yeah. about the whole tyrannical um, director thing that forgets... That their that their extras need a moment to breathe, <laughs> or that are you know human beings. Yeah, yeah, exactly. Like I haven't done big productions or anything. I've made like for fun movies with friends in our backyards and stuff like that. Even then, I've had situations where someone had to tap me on the shoulder and be like, "Is there any reason we're sitting out in this cold barn right now yeah. if you don't need us for the next forty five minutes?" You know, you you talk about like people doing just crazy things that that at the time seem like okay ideas. Mm. Uh, you know, let's 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 take this back. Let's go real old school, like silent film era. Oh uh, dear. You, you know the Charlie Chaplin film, The Gold Rush. I've seen it. Yes, it's wonderful. Yeah. Uh, for those of you who are listening at home, if you have not seen The Gold Rush or you don't, if you haven't heard of The Gold Rush, you probably know the like very famous shot from the film where uh, Charlie Chaplin has two rolls on the end of forks and he's making them dance. Yes. Yes. Iconic bit of cinema. But I mean, half, the- half of the stuff, sorry, I don't mean to interrupt. Half of the stuff you see in, in, in the gold rush has become shorthand for poor person. Exactly. At the end of the film, he's, uh, <laughs> his character is so down on his luck that he sits down for dinner and, and what is he having but boiled boot? <laughs> and f- f- for him to actually do this, what he had done was uh, Charlie Chaplin went out and he had them make 20 black licorice boots. But yeah, 20 different boots. And I believe he ate them all or almost yeah, all. He ate all of them over the course of three days. And these were full sized boots made out of licorice. I was about to say. A boot's worth of licorice. That's a lot yeah. of licorice. <laughs> and he ate 20 of them over three days. Now, some of you out there might not know what happens to your body if you oh. eat an excess amount of licorice. Uh, licorice for hundreds of years has had medicinal uses. And one of them includes doing something to your lower intestinal tract. Yeah. Um. Needless to say, after he got done shooting the gold rush charlie chaplin was well acquainted with his toilet (laughs) um but you know in the moment he's like this is a great idea and it's gonna make for an iconic movie moment and it did 
Like, and it did. How, how many how many cartoons from the 40s or 50s have we seen where people resort to eating their hat or their boot or whatever? Yeah, it's it's a classic, as you said, it's it's classic shorthand for being poor. It makes me think of like when you read trivia about movies. One of people's favorite pieces of trivia about weird things that actors had to do would be Willy Wonka and the Chocolate Factory, where Gene Wilder eats that cup. Oh um, yeah! If people remember that movie, it's it's in the chocolate factory. It's like a huge forest area made of candy, where Gene Wilder like ends it by grabbing a cup and just like drinking a pot of tea and then eating the cup, just taking a bite of it. That thing was made of wax, <laughs> <laughs> not sugar, wax, because yeah. sugar would melt. It, like, or get... it, it looked like it might have been like made out of like lemon drops or something, but yeah, it was yeah, it actually it's wax. made of wax. And he chews on it, spits out. That sounds gross. That sounds like a hard thing to do to eat wax and keep a straight face. And then you hear about Chaplin. <laughs> that's that's that times a hundred. Both of those actors, Chaplin and Wilder, were you know comedic geniuses. Oh, absolutely. and were the kind of people who could commit to something 100% no matter how like just nasty or <laughs> you know unpleasant it was they were just able to you know put everything into that moment because they knew that it was going to be funny so you get nothing you lose good day sir this is without even going into the stuff that is just outright physically dangerous like oh, if yeah. we're in if we're in silent movie territory now, the most famous example would be Buster Keaton. Uh, but there is a very famous scene where like the whole side of a house falls over, and he's standing right where the open window is, so he doesn't get hurt at all. That wasn't faked. <laughs> yeah, no, that there was no special effects that could have achieved that at the time, other than just doing it. So, so they actually did that. They had to mathematically figure out exactly where the window would be and Buster Keaton would have to not move not flinch not move a muscle not make a face not anything because they got one shot to do yeah, this and, and if they were wrong if their he calculations were off dude gets crushed so so that's not effort in the terms of oh I had to do this crazy, th- crazy thing that's effort in the terms of I'm literally putting my life on the line for a cheap laugh in a movie yeah and you know we still we still see that kind of stuff today you know with I could bring up basically any moment where Tom Cruise does something for a Mission Impossible <laughs> film. Well, he's famous for it, right? For these, yeah, absolutely but crazy I mean, like, stuff. Stunts. The one that the one that stands out the most to me is in Ghost Protocol, uh, the yeah. scene where he's climbing up the Burj Khalifa. The thing about that sequence is that, yeah, he did have um he had a minor amount of rigging to keep him from falling, so he wasn't really in necessarily any like serious mortal danger. Mm. But to actually do that stunt himself, Tom Cruise had to push to have the insurance company fired because the insurance (laughs) company that was insuring the film did not want him to do that. And meanwhile, he's just like, I, I, I'm 100% doing this. So like, we're going to get a different insurance company who says it's okay. But if we're talking about, about people being put in mortal danger, I feel Mm. like we would be remiss to not bring up. Uh, the Uma Thurman situation with Kill Bill Volume 2. Oh, boy. It, a few years ago, there was a bunch of controversy about this because uh, basically what had happened was there was a sequence where uh, the bride was driving this car through these, this rather tight kind of back road sort of thing. Mm. And Quentin Tarantino insisted that it was actually Uma Thurman and insisted that she was actually driving. And it, it just sort of wound up being this perfect storm of terribleness and ultimately she wound up crashing the car and Oof. like you know luckily she wasn't too seriously injured but you know is it worth it to really risk your actor's life and now you know it's not all just people in front of the camera who are putting in a ton of work to achieve amazing things sometimes the people who are behind the camera actually wind up putting in way more work than the performers themselves. You know, you oh, absolutely. Your, your special effects teams, your stunt coordinators, your costume designers, your writers, you know, just the the set builders, all these people who just put in crazy work and wind up producing amazing pieces. And sometimes all for the sake of maybe three seconds of screen time. Oh, yeah. Like like those... The, Name a fantasy movie and you have this swooping shot of a, I don't know, an ancient castle or whatever, or a temple full of old cave paintings and stuff. Somebody made that. 
Yeah. Or, you know, you, you think about like the work that went into the costume designing for like Lord of the Rings. Lord of the Rings is an infamous example. Where you have you have somebody who spends literal months weaving a chainmail shirt that's worn by, you know, Rohan extra number three, who's in the background of like two shots. Yeah, I think I think I was looking at it earlier today in some of the big war segments of the Lord of the Rings movies. It has been a while since I've seen those. But from what I read, it took literally two years oh, yeah. to make all the armor for just one battle scene. Which, like we talked about before, is done in wild short cuts. Yeah. And again, Weta Workshops is another example of, you know, we could do an entire episode just talking about the work that they've done. You know, because they they put so much time and effort into literally every project. But, you know, that's the kind of thing that sometimes... You don't necessarily pay attention to, but, you know, when you're watching a movie, you're not seeing all of these things, but they're, you know, massive feats that take a ton of just manpower and a ton of determination to get done. Mm. My, the, the one example that I absolutely wanted to bring up here is the special effects behind Tron. Do you, do you know how they actually did all of the like light effects on the suits and the environments in the original Tron. I'm gonna level with you. If if I have seen Tron, it was when I was a kid. I know Tron, I know the scenes, but I don't remember like a coherent narrative from you it. Gotta, you gotta sit down and watch Tron. Oh, I absolutely, oh, I know. Like I want 100%. to at some points. It's it's a classic, I know. Plus it's always fun to see, this is a tangent, but it's always fun to see um, what people thought computers worked like at some point. Yeah. And that's basically the entirety of this movie. But the way that they achieved the look of Tron, which yeah, I know the look, you know, I know the how look. it looks. Yes. The way that they achieved that was they shot the film basically in black and white. And then after that, the, the, the negatives of the film were taken by the special effects team who went through frame by frame with a special type of paint and literally painted the glowing effect onto the film. So it's a way more precise version of old school colorization then. Basically, yeah. It's, oh my goodness. It, it was very, very similar to the rotoscoping effects that were done on the old Star Wars films for the lightsabers. I see you have constructed a new lightsaber. Yes, I'm, I'm thinking even further back, like before color yeah. film was a thing when you still wanted to do color. Um, cause now yeah, we're where they would stuff literally like ink each frame. Yeah, now we're talking stuff like Wizard of Oz or even earlier than that, you know? Yeah. Where it would be someone's job to fill in color on these 8 millimeter, by the way, <laughs> film rolls. There are yeah. some incredibly early examples of coloring in film that are done by people with little brushes working on a f piece of film roll. I challenge anybody to shoot something in black and white and then mm -hmm. take it into After Effects and color frame Oof. it. Frame. Oh, I, I'm sure Even that's that a movie would be somewhere easier that... than what they had to do back then. But like, I'm that's convinced the there's a movie somewhere, some little indie movie that has done exactly that, and I applaud them, man. <laughs> oh, I'm sure that totally sounds like. And if not, maybe I should get to work on that. <laughs> yeah, but you know, that just special effects teams. You know what they do in the background. Sometimes, like, it's one of those things where if they're doing their job right, you don't even notice that they did it. That's that's what you also say about editors, really. But yes, it's absolutely. True. But sometimes, um, sometimes the special effects teams wind up coming up with some just with some crazy ways of achieving things. One one example, and probably one of the most famous examples of this mm -hmm. that I can think of, is the spinning hallway sequence from Inception. Yes, which was sort of a combination of special effects, combination of set design, you know, because basically how they achieved the spinning hallway was they literally built a replica hallway that was on this special rig that allowed it to spin 360 mm. degrees. Um, so what you're seeing in that movie, you're not seeing like Joseph Gordon-Levitt on wires and they're throwing him around. Like he's in a hallway that's spinning. This is this like this like next level from what you see in some films. Like take any horror movie, whether there's like a monster in the corner of, of, the, of the ceiling or something. We've all seen that. Or for that matter, Spider-Man walking around a lot yeah. of the times they do that by simply building a set upside down and having an actor act upside down. And that in itself, that in itself is not easy. Yeah. Um, the, these tricks you see in some movies like Bruce Campbell is infamous for being able to act backwards. <laughs> <laughs> Gotta love some reverse filming. Love it. Reverse filming is a crazy technique. It's not as easy as it sounds. Believe no. me. It's it, way it more difficult than people. <laughs> 
thing. It takes incredible skill. And so does like being on your back for an entire shoot and looking like you're crouching up in a corner. But being in a hallway that actually moves and spins, that's some next level stuff right there. Yeah, and on top of that, like you have to you have to nail the choreography while keeping your remember your lines don't remember your lines don't let the fact that suddenly you don't have footing anymore shake off your your line delivery yeah it's incredible and like i know that there were there were other rigs before inception that did similar things Um, that must have been i can't think of one right now but absolutely some of the some of the star trek films had sets that literally shook Oh yeah, I've I've heard about that. You always think about like you know Star Trek when the ship gets hit, everyone just starts yeah. flailing and they shake the camera. Some of the films yeah. they had they had sets that shook so that the actors would have natural reactions. But this just you know again this took it to a whole other level. It must also just be so disorienting as a person to be in a room that literally spins. Yeah, can't imagine <laughs> that was easy. Why not? Because the van will be in freefall. Can't drop you without gravity. But speaking of not easy to film, so, okay, have you seen Iron Man 3? I have, but not not since it was, I've seen every Marvel movie, um, but I haven't seen it since it was in theaters. So the skydiving sequence in Iron Man 3 after yes. they escape Air Force One, that was actually done. Like the whole like barrel of monkeys thing where they're all like attached by, their hands aren't actually being shot to be kept you know, together. To achieve that, the stunt coordinator and his team had to spend time to actually figure out if it was even possible to do that sequence without using green screens. First of all, they got the Red Bull skydiving team, got them involved, and then they spent two days of constant jumping and constant rehearsing to see if they could actually do that practically. They wound up realizing that they could, they could film it properly. They could do all the choreography that needed to be done the correct way. And then when it came time to be filming, they had stunt performers that had parachutes sewn into their costumes so that it would look like they didn't have parachutes, but they actually did, you know, for safety reasons. And it just, it's one of those things that like you watch it and yeah, it's a big, exciting sequence, but you don't think about the amount of planning and effort that had to have gone into actually making that scene happen again prep work the kind of research people have to do to even see if it's possible to do what they're imagining yeah um it's an animation so it's a slightly different example but if you if you watch the op the dvd for pixar's up mm-hmm. there's like a 25 minute documentary about the entire crew going to these actual cliffs just to make sure it looked right and and does it make sense to run here? Are there actually woods here when we need woods? Th- that takes, that's a lot of people you got to put on a plane and take somewhere and do research. Yeah. It's, we don't think about these things. We don't think about how much work goes into this. But even, even movies that people love to mock that aren't particularly good sometimes have incredible work put into them. Um, that, that's why I try, not to, I try not to be as harsh on a lot of movies as many critics are because... People work on these, man. And that's that's where I'm going to go to Star Wars for a sec. Because we all we all love making fun of the prequel trilogy. I mean, um, there, is, there is a segment of people online who love the prequels. My point is, a lot of people love making a lot of fun of episode one. But we, have, we can't deny that the pod racing segment of Star Wars episode one is famous. Oh yeah, it spawned an entire game that is amazing. That's what people say, I haven't played it. It's great. I think it's coming out on Switch here soon. One of the things that Star Wars, that the prequel trilogy gets flack for is that they really, really, really wanted to show up, show off newfangled CGI in every moment possible. Then boom, getting very scared and grabbing that Jedi and pow, Misa here. Pretty much to the detriment of the films, largely. But there is one moment in it that is not CGI and absolutely looks like it could have been. And that would be the crowd shots of people during the pot races. Yeah. Because this is this is honestly incredible. That was not done with CG, even though you could very easily have made maybe, let's say, 50 people and just copy-pasted them, and you wouldn't have noticed as an average audience. But no, somebody actually had to carve nearly half a million Q-tips and, like, paint clothing on them. And I, I don't even think they had to. They could have easily done this in a cheaper way, pos- probably. Like, I'm not a special effects man. The one time that George wanted to do something practically in the pre yeah, trilogy. Yeah. And it's and, and it know, has to be the crowd shot in, in episode It's a one. whole bunch of Q-tips. But it's a bunch of Q-tips 
on these models of the audience seating and then a fan that just blows on the side to make them look like they're moving. And that just goes to show what you can do with how little. I mean, a half million Q-tips is not little, but it's Q-tips. Yeah. And what kind of mind do you have to have to come up with that as a solution? I mean, some of these special effects guys are like, you know, we always talk about... Oh, I consider them magicians. Yeah, and like, that's that's what I was going to say. Like, when you're talking about special effects people, the term wizard gets thrown around a lot. Uh And like, it's really not an exaggeration a lot of the time. Well, I mean, one of... I believe it's Dark Star, John Carpenter's first movie, like even before Halloween. Yeah, that was uh, uh, which Dark Star was uh, a film that was written by Dan O'Bannon. It yeah. uh, served like pretty directly as the inspiration for Alien. Yes, and I believe there are scenes where like weren't there interior shots of the spaceship that were done by like painting egg cartons? Yeah, and the the alien itself is basically a beach ball. With like stuff added to it, and yes, it looks cheap. It is a cheap movie. It was a it was an indie movie made for pocket lint. Basically. Well, it's basically but a student film. It works. Yeah, you don't think about it while you're watching it. I mean, you think about it at first, but then like your suspension is you get wrapped up kicks kicks in. But again, I'm not even talking about whether or not it's impressive. It kind of is, considering how little they had to work it with. Yeah, I'm more thinking the line of creative thinking you have to have to think. Maybe we can make an alien out of a beach ball. But you know. You think about, in terms of, like, special effects changing the way that you shoot films, we got to talk about The Mandalorian. Right. Now we're in Star Wars again. So, yeah. Going back to Star Wars again. So, The Mandalorian was shot in a very interesting way. Basically, the majority of the series was shot on, like, digital sets. The way this worked was the actors would go into this area that was completely almost about 270 degrees of the set was just covered in these giant HDR screens. And projected on these HDR screens was effectively a video game environment. Like, it was actually done within Unreal Engine, like, projected on these screens so that, you know, all the proper light fall off and everything would be on the actors and everything. And then it was shot with this rig that was sort of a combination of a digital camera as in like a camera that exists within the digital space and an actual camera so they could move the camera and the background would shift to match huh. the the angle that they're trying to get and that is some next level rear projection right there <laughs> yeah i mean it, it is effectively like when you break it down it's kind of just like modern rear projection that's also the thing with special effects you talk about how they change how we make movies like Things that were done in King Kong that nobody had done at the time because they literally did not know making a movie like King Kong would be physically possible. There are techniques done in King Kong we still use, like, say, rear projection. I mean, like, yeah, it it looks a little bit different today. Of course, because it was primitive. It was the first time they tried. The cameras weren't as advanced as they are now. Yes, it looks off with modern eyes, but imagine being in a time of your life where you still remember when movies didn't exist. And then going to see a giant a giant ape crawling up a building. There's that classic story of people going to the movies and uh, freaking out because they see a train coming at them and they think there's actually oh, yeah. a train coming at them. So they all freaked out and ran out of the theater. Now, okay, so far in this episode, we've talked a lot, or rather, I think gushed, would be the more correct term. <laughs> That's true. Uh, That's talking true. about some of the craziness that has been put into some of these scenes. But let's be real. Sometimes we don't quite need the amount of effort to be put into these shots that are put yeah. into these shots. You know, we were talking earlier about that sequence from Titanic. To me, that's a perfect example of a scene where, like, you gotta gotta ask yourself, how much would the authenticity really have affected that sequence? Yeah, who cares if one person is 5% drier than one of the others? <laughs> yeah, how many people were paying attention to the extras in the background and not bawling their eyes out over Leo dying? Like There, there are two incredibly beautiful people who, whose romance you followed for the better part of three hours at this point. Yeah, like you're, you're focused on pay that. Attention to them. You're not focused <laughs> on... on Joe Schmo in the background. Yeah, probably not. But yeah, we're, we're, we're going into like, did we really need to do this yeah. territory? And another prime example that we talked about earlier, the car crash with Uma Thurman. Like, mm, right. putting your actor into danger for a cool shot, is that, like, necessary? 
you know. There's a gray area with that when they sign up to do it and say, I want to be the one in this stunt. But yeah, yeah, I, I absolutely see what you mean. I don't condone it. Well, and I, if I remember correctly, I think, I think in that situation, Uma Thurman expressed that she was really not comfortable. Yeah. With what was happening. And he's just like, ah, do it anyways. And like, there's, there's like a dozen ways that you could have gotten a similar shot without Mm. putting someone in potentially mortal peril. Like, it's just a movie. It's not worth it. Like to potentially injure somebody. Oh, um, I absolutely agree. And even, even if we move away from like life threatening situations, there are just times where it's like, okay, I realize how technically impressive this is. And I understand why you would do it. But also, did it really need to happen? I have a couple examples from animation mm. in this case. Um, a lot of people, animation obviously also takes a lot of a lot of work. Oh yeah, and a lot of people tend to think, oh, but they don't have to build a set. No, but every time something moves, somebody has to draw that thing. It's true. Um, so so there's that. I'm thinking Pixar. Pixar are like the they're the top of the crop in this case. Like they're always doing everything to push as much technical prowess into every movie, and that's admirable, of course. But one of the most famous examples of them maybe going a little bit overboard would be Monsters Incorporated, if you remember that one. Yeah. With uh, Sully, the big blue monster. Yeah, all the all the hair simulation. Come on, fight that flock. Fight that flock. Scary monsters don't have flock. Exactly. That model. This is a movie from, when was it? When did it come out? 2001 or something? Yeah, I think it was like 2000, um, 2001. It's like they're somewhere between third and fifth movie at this point. I mean, these guys invented the CGI family movie, basically. Basically. And they're on the, then they're on movie four or five, and they're really pulling out all the stuff with everything. I appreciate it. I respect it. That model of Sully has two million individual hairs on his body for the sake of giving that fur as realistic a sway as possible. Just thinking about the render time. I was about to say, the render, I read an article about it earlier, the render meant that one frame could take up to 12 hours. I would like to remind the listeners that a frame is a 24th of a second in most cases. Yeah, when it comes to now, film. Now translate that to a 100-minute movie. <laughs> uh, that, also, that also makes me think of, uh, there were similar, there were similar, like, just insane render times on uh, Final Fantasy The Spirits Within. In fairness, that did look incredible for the time. I don't much care for the movie. <laughs> At the time, yes, it did look incredible. Like, they were they were trying to push uh, the main character that, Aki, as being, like, the first digital actor. Yeah. Like, yeah, I remember she that. had, like, spreads in Maxim and stuff. Um, I mean, parts of it still look incredible. Oh, yeah. Like, it's not... Honest, it, 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 for the most part, holds up today. Not necessarily as a movie, but like <laughs> as a like tech demo, it looks great. Oh, absolutely. Um, but speaking of unnecessary, so Sam Raimi's Spider-Man. Yes. You know, Wonderful. Well, the second one is really good. Second one is amazing. The first one's pretty yes. good. Uh, one of those. I mean, one, it set the standard. So yeah, one of those films that did an X Men. It's like if if the first Spider-Man and the X Men films didn't happen, we wouldn't have the MCU probably. Oh, we absolutely wouldn't. Like I said, they set a standard. Oh yeah, but there's that everybody then broke in two thousand seven ish. Ish, but there's one scene, or rather one shot in that first mm. Spider-Man film. I I I'm willing to bet that the majority of our audience thinks was done with either CGI or like reverse filming or something. And that is, uh, there's a moment where you know Peter's he's eating lunch. We get that that amazing shot of Mary Jane in slow motion as she walks by and then she trips and he catches her tray and all of the food. They did that practically. He was, he was actually sitting there trying to catch all that stuff. It took 156 takes. (laughs) We're back to the insane amount of takes. Did anyone notice that it wasn't CGI? No. That's the thing about that shot. Like that's impressive. But you like, if you told me that was done with a computer or done with like wire work or something, I would be like, yeah, that. And we 100%. gotta remember one thing. This is another purely practical thing about filmmaking. This this was done in two thousand and one ish. Most major pictures were still being done with film. Yeah, and film is expensive. Film costs money. Film is expensive. Film guys. costs a lot of money. I think at that. I think at that point they were starting to make the move to digital. I don't think Spider Man One was done digital. I don't think. so. I don't know. The second one. I'm sure someone been. can correct me. Might have been, because then we're in like 2004, so that makes a lot of sense. Yeah. 
but I think a lot I think a lot of people were still being traditionalists about it. Pretty the much. thing is, we can talk for ages about whether film looks better than digital, but digital is practical. Digital you can film forever, you can do as much as you want, you can delete it, nobody cares. You're you're not producing any waste that way. Film costs money for every frame. I will give you a definitive answer right now. Film does look better, but use digital <laughs> because it's cheaper and easier and like we get we can accomplish way more with it yeah. in a lot of ways. I mean, film, wonderful. It's kind of becoming a relic for a reason. Get a, you can get away with using film if you're Christopher Nolan. <laughs> That's true. Otherwise, like... But my point is... Go digital. In, in an age where you had the choice between digital and film, I think they could have made it digital if they chose to at that point. I think at that point, technologically, they might not have necessarily had a choice. Okay, I don't know for certain. But my point is, 157 takes with film for one gag. Yeah. Is ridiculous. There is no practical reason to do this. Like, Sam Raimi is somebody who, you know, he is infamous for putting a lot of effort into things where you're like, is that really necessary? (laughs) You know, we could sit here and we could talk all day about what he did to Bruce Campbell during the filming of any of the Evil Dead films. Which are wonderful. Could you imagine, could you imagine your like lifelong best friend whipping you with a reed? While you're on this mechanism that's spinning you super fast, 360 degrees. I mean, in fairness, again, I've made like short films with friends and we're talking like camcorder made with Part of the fun is torturing your friends, I will admit. I mean, I made one of my friends on his birthday sit around practically naked in an abandoned slaughterhouse wearing a pig mask. I have absolutely tortured my friends. (laughs) (laughs) But I mean, like, but I mean, like, you you just gotta, you gotta ask yourself sometimes to be like, is that worth it? Like, really? (laughs) I don't. Exactly what I mean, mean, I guess, I guess and in Evil Dead's case, like those films all turned out to be, you know, classics. So I guess I really shouldn't question and also, the methods. A lot of the stuff we talk about now where it sounds ridiculous, like that was the way they had to do it because they really had nothing to work with. I mean, at least on the first two. S- Sam Raimi has said in interviews that it wasn't necessary for him to beat Bruce Campbell, <laughs> but he did it <laughs> because he wanted to. <laughs> Oh, well. <laughs> but... That explains so much. You know. Speaking of doing things because you want to, I, I'm in another area of animation now. Uh, studio Leica, if we're talking like big animation studios. I love Leica. They do, not, they do not get the attention they deserve, by the way. Yeah. They absolutely deserve way bigger blockbuster hits. They absolutely deserve to be ranked up there with Disney and Pixar. They do incredible work. For those that don't know, this is the studio that makes um, stop motion films. Yeah, they did uh, Coraline, uh, Kubo and the Paranorman, Two Strings. Norman, I believe it's them too. Most recently, um, what was it called? Missing Link. Yeah, that was them. Which was also wonderful. Box Trolls. Was that them? Um, they, I'm they, entirely sure. That, that was them. That was absolutely yeah. them. But the thing about Coraline, wonderful movie, by the way. Oh, yeah. A horror movie for children that is absolutely a horror movie first. Well, I mean, it's also, it's, also, it's also Neil Gaiman. So, you know. Yeah. That's an incredible movie. It's beautiful. Everything is immaculately crafted. Like, there are some truly insane shots in it that, like, this must have taken months just for these three seconds. Pretty much. The, co- the costume designer for this actually made underwear and socks for every character in every outfit. At no point is anybody in their underwear. <laughs> Why? <laughs> this is a person who said and made these clothes with literally a, a needle that was as thin as human hair to make clothes for these dolls. It doesn't have to I make don't... sense, dude. It just has to look good. But that's what we're talking about, like, because they wanted to. Yeah, pretty much. I, there is no practical reason to do that. There is no cost-effective reason to do this. So that you there you can talk about doing it for the art. Yeah. And I mean, like, I think that that's, you know, wrapping everything up. I think that that's mm. the important point that we should take away from this discussion. Is that even though some of these scenes might not have been, you know, the most worth it, even though these details that people are putting in are, you know, not seen or some of the stuff that winds up getting there on on camera is basically borderline mundane. It all just goes to show Mm. that, you know, there are some crazy lengths that some filmmakers will go to to produce cinema and to produce their vision to create something that they know will connect with an audience. And like while being on set can be incredibly fun and like. I'm saying that as somebody who's been on productions, who's yes. who's been on sets. It's a ton of fun, but it's still a lot of work. And, you know, work is work. And you don't know how much work it is until you're there. Yeah. I mean, you can listen to us talk. You can watch the documentaries. You can read the books. You don't know till you're there. But I will tell you that, like, 
no matter how much effort it takes, it is really easy to find yourself sitting there going, I don't care how much like effort this is going to take. I don't care how long this is going to take. There's mm. just something about being on a set that makes you go, I'm in it. I'm here. Let's do it. You're seeing you're seeing the carrot at the end of the stick rather than the path, basically. Basically, the 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 ends are the, re, the ultimate reward. The ends are justifying the means when you're making films. Yeah, yeah, and, and when you look back in hindsight, like a lot of these examples we've talked about, even the people involved in it have been like, yeah, maybe I shouldn't have done that afterwards. Yeah, but but if you ask them while they were doing it, they'd be oh, they, they would were tear your head off for the most part. I mean, obviously, yep. like Uma Thurman wasn't super stoked, but you know, <laughs> for the most part. People are excited. And even if it doesn't turn out great, you got to kind of appreciate the effort that people put in. Oh, absolutely. Uh, just because, you know, it's all for the love of it. And if people if people didn't love doing what they do when it comes to movies, I feel like 100% we would be able to tell in the final product. I mean, you can. Yeah. Point is, if people are willing to put in the work there on set, sometimes yes. that alone is enough. So basically what I would take away from this is next time you want to give a movie grief for not turning out how you want it, for being stupid or for looking weird or something, try and remember how many people work on it. Try and remember how hard a lot of people work on things you don't even consider. I think this is worth taking into consideration when you're rating a movie, personally. I see too many critics that get too wrapped up in sounding smart or sounding clever when they want to bash something. And I'm not saying love everything, of course not. Be critical. Absolutely be critical. But... Keep in mind that people are pouring their hearts and soul into these things. I think that I think that we just need to walk away from it and go, you know, have situations where you don't say, oh, this movie is bad, but shift it to be more like this movie wasn't for me. Yeah, that's that's basically my my attitude to movies in general. Yeah. I didn't mean for this to turn into like a, a moratorium <laughs> on like, I mean, that might be film criticism, too. but that's fine. I think that's... Sorry, I've worked with film critics. I've seen some bad oh, yeah. examples. Like, <laughs> trust me, me too. Uh, but that I think that's a good point to end things on. So really the only yeah. thing that we have left is just, uh, Esh, where can people find you on the internet? I happen to be all over the internet. I have a YouTube channel that is called Fiction Addiction where I talk about all sorts of silly media. And we're talking a bit more obscure here. I might cover some big movies here and there, but we're talking weird old cartoons, weird old games, weird old movies. Just stuff I think is fun to share with the world. Yeah. Like I said, that channel is called Fiction Addiction. So you can find me there. Um, you can also find me on Twitter, Esh underscore Fic Addict, F-I-C Addict, you know? Yeah. And the same on Instagram, where I also draw. Yeah, definitely go check out Esh on all that. And if you want more of me, you can check me out. I'm on YouTube under Bender Waffles. You can also find me on Twitter under the same name. That is B-E-N-D-E-R-W-A-F-F-L-E-S. Just get over there, follow me, all that good stuff. Uh, and we'll catch you next time. I have spoken. So what do you guys think? Which scenes took a ton of effort that you guys think were worth it? Or maybe some that you think were not worth it? Be sure to let us know down in the comments below. And while you're down there, why not consider subscribing to Screen Rant for more awesome videos just like this. Thanks for watching and stay safe out there.